أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين uh, إن شاء الله we're picking up uh, this is video number 17 on the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام's military legendary legacy uh, the era of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq رضي الله عنه picking up on page number 360 Pertaining to the hadith that Umar ibn Khattab quoted, um, the latter part of it in Arabic, فَإِذَا قَالُوهَا عَصَمُوا مِنِّي دِمَاءَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ إِلَّا بِحَقِّهَا So if they say the testimony of faith, then their blood and their lives are protected from me, except if there is a right. And there is a right and obligation upon every Muslim to pay the zakah for zakah, like salah, like the testimony, the shahada. Hajj and fasting is one of the five pillars of Al-Islam. By rejecting any of the, those pillars, one ex exits the fault of Al-Islam. In the end, Abu Bakr Siddiq made the right decision. In fact, had he made any other decisions, the Muslims would have suffered disastrous consequences. Had it not been for Allah Ta'ala and then the firm resolve of Abu Bakr Siddiq, corruption would have become rampant throughout the earth and the inhabitants of the Arabian Peninsula would likely have returned to what they had previously believed in during the pre-Islamic days of ignorance. It was as if the weight of the world was being placed on Abu Bakr Siddiq, Shadows radiallahu anhu. He had to make a crucial decision only a brief period after he made the important and at the at first unpopular decision of sending out Osama's army. Uh, as matters stood, the Muslims were being threatened by the followers of Musaylama and Al-Aswad and so, and so some companions began to ask themselves whether it was wise to create even more enemies. After all, those who were refusing to pay the zakah were still openly professing their belief in and has the right to be worshipped except Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, excuse me, as unpopular as his decision might have potentially been. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu wanted to live up. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu wanted to live up to his duties as the Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As such, he understood that the religion was complete. It had already been revealed in its entirety. So it was not his place to change or modify it in the least. When certain companions came to him in order to convince him that he should not wage war against the people who refused to pay zakah, Abu Bakr Siddiq gave not a sermon in response but a single sentence that had the same impact and effect as a long and eloquent sermon. He said, Revelation has ceased to descend and the religion is complete. Should I allow it to decrease, example to be changed and modified while I'm alive? Question mark. So he asked them, according to another narration, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu said, O Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah, unite the people, appease them, and be gentle with them. To which Abu Bakr Siddiq replied, Were you strong during the days of pre-Islamic ignorance only so that you can become a coward in Islam's time? Revelation has ceased to descend, the religion is complete. So shall I allow it to decrease? Example, for it to be changed and modified while I'm still alive. Before making a final decision, Abu Bakr Siddiq listened to the various opinions and suggestions of the Prophet ﷺ's companions. Only after clearly hearing them out did he announce his final decision, but even though he did consult the companions, which was in keeping with the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, one thing is for sure, once he made a final decision, which he arrived as quickly, he became firm and resolute. His decision confirmed he did not waver or have doubt about what course of action he would take. The quality of not wavering was one for which Abu Bakr Siddiq was known throughout his life. In the end, when Abu Bakr Siddiq announced his final decision, 
All of the companions who initially disagreed, discarded their previous opinions and gave their complete support to Abu Bakr Siddiq's decision. Both reorganizing and acknowledging the fact that he was in the right all along, did Abu Bakr Siddiq stand in the fact of initial disagreement, both regarding the decision to send out Osama's army and the decision of waging war against all of the apostates. And on both occasions, Abu Bakr Siddiq was right while everyone while everyone else was wrong. It is for this reason that Sa'id ibn Musayyib, may Allah Ta'ala have mercy on him, said Abu Bakr was the most knowledgeable person among us. And he was unsurpassed among them at arriving at the best decision regarding any given matter, but especially regarding matters of some importance. To be sure, it was Abu Bakr Siddiq's superior faith that allowed his superior faith that allowed him to see through a seemingly complicated issue and to then arrive at a correct conclusion. As such, he radiallahu anhu alone was able to see that zakah could not be separated from the testimony of faith. For if one believes in the oneness of Allah, one must accept the rights Allah made binding upon mankind. And Allah's right over one's wealth is zakah that one has to pay to the deserving. And needy after all, one's wealth ultimately belongs not to one's own self but to Allah Ta'ala. In short, Abu Bakr Siddiq made it clear that without zakah, the testimony of faith has no value in the lives of people. Therefore, as leader of the Muslim nation, it fell upon the shoulders or his shoulders to fight against those who refused to pay the zakah, just as it was his duty to wage war against those who refused to say, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. This understanding of the religion, Abu Bakr Siddiq informed the companions, radiallahu anhu, was true to Islam. He informed the companions that this was the true to Islam. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was of course right for Allah Ta'ala gave a clear and stern warning to those who believe in a part of the book while they disbelieve in other parts of it. أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْضِ فَمَا جَزَاءُ مَنْ يَفْعَلُ ذَلِكَ مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا خِزْيٌ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ أَشَدِّ الْعَذَابِ وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ And the meaning. Then do you believe in a part of the scripture and reject the rest? Then what is the, compense, uh, what is the recompense for of those who do so among you except disgrace in the life of this world? And on the day of resurrection they shall be consigned to the most grievous torment. And Allah is not unaware of what you do. This is the Quran, Surah number 2, verse number, or ayah number, I'm sorry, 85. Abu Bakr Siddiq's uncompromising stance against the apostates was inspired by Allah. Of that, there is no doubt. The credit of reserving the sanctity of Al Islam following the Prophet's demise goes to Allah. And then to Abu Bakr Siddiq, after all was said, and done after the Muslims met the apostates on various battlefields. And after the dust of war had settled, people truly appreciated what Abu Bakr Siddiq had done to defeat the apostates. His stance was similar to the ones taken by the prophets and messengers of previous eras, which should come as no surprise since he was not merely a Khalifa, but rather he was the Khalifa of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He radiallahu anhu lived up to his role and he will continue to deserve the praise, respect and supplication of all Muslims until Allah inherits both the earth and those that are on it. Faith Abu Bakr's plan to defend al Madina. The various tribes that refused to pay the zakah sent delegations to al Madina in order to meet with Abu Bakr and negotiate terms of peace with him. Yes, they wanted to make peace, but they were adamant in their decision to refuse to pay the zakah. But once they witnessed firsthand Abu Bakr's uncompromising resolve, they realized that they were no longer remained or they 
there no longer remained any point to further negotiations. And so they packed up their things and left al Madina. Before leaving, however, they arrived at two conclusions concerning their situation. First, since the Islamic ruling regarding the payment of zakah was clear, it was pointless to hope that the Khalifa of the Muslims would compromise and negotiate terms with them, especially considering the fact that all of the Muslims in al Madina became convinced of the soundness of his firm stance and decided to stand firmly. They decided to stand firmly and loyally by his by Abu Bakr Siddiq's side against all enemies. And second, it was very important to take advantage of the weakness or perceived weakness of the Muslims, who, because of Usama's expedition, were few in number at this time. This meant that they had to attack Al Madina with all of their might in the hope of bringing down the Khalifat and destroying the religion of Islam. While the apostate delegates were on the face of it, negotiating terms of peace, Abu Bakr Siddiq cast penetrating glances at their facial expressions. And what he saw alarmed him. Certain believers are blessed by Allah with the ability of reading the faces of people. This talent is not magical in nature, but instead is derived from a profound faith in Allah, wisdom, and other similar qualities. Abu Bakr Siddiq, truly blessed in this regard, read these qualities in the faces of the apostates, the treachery, baseness, and wickedness. So, as soon as the delegates left, Abu Bakr Siddiq said to his companions, Verily, the delegates perceive that you are few in number, therefore you cannot be certain about whether they will come during the day or during the night, but rather what is certain as they will surely make an attempt to take al Madina. They hoped that they, we would agree to a truce with them, but we rejected their offer, so be ready and get ready for war. Abu Bakr Siddiq took the following steps in ordering to secure al Madina from attack and to launch a successful campaign against all apostates in the region. He radiallahu anhu ordered the inhabitants of al Madina to spend their nights in the masjid so that they could constantly be vigilant and ready to defend the Prophet wasallam's city. B. He placed groups of guards at the various entry points of al Madina. It was their job to spend each night at those points and defend the city from enemy attacks. C. Over each set of guards, Abu Bakr Siddiq appointed battle-tested and brave leaders. Ali ibn Abi Talib, Zubair ibn Al-Awwam, Talha ibn Ubaidullah, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. D. He radiallahu anhu requested the help of neighboring tribes happily for the Muslims. Various neighboring tribes did not apostatize but instead remain firm upon Islam. I am referring to here to the tribes of Al-Aslam, Ghifar, Muzayna, Ashja, Juhayna, and Kaab. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu sent messengers to the leaders of those tribes, ordering them to join in his fight against the apostates. They answered his call, filing or filling al Madina streets with their soldiers who brought along with them horses, camels, and weapons, all of which were under the direct control of Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The reinforcements were at once much needed and of good practical value. The tribe of Juhayna alone sent 400 of its men to Abu Bakr Siddiq, along with a number of horses and camels, also Amr ibn Mura of the Mujayna tribe brought him or brought with him 100 camels in order to help his Muslim brothers. And Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu then distribu- distributed those camels among the people. E. Abu Bakr Siddiq was concerned not only about apostates who lived relatively near to Al Madinah, but also about apostates who lived in far off lands. The latter did not pose a direct or serious threat to Al Madinah, but they did pose a dangerous threat to the, re- to the region in general. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu knew that sooner or later he would have to deal with them. 
And he radiallahu anhu chose to deal with them immediately. He radiallahu anhu did so by sending out letters to Muslim governors in distant provinces. Just. Just as sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had done when he was alive, ordering them to fight against the apostates in their respective regions. For example, he sent a letter to the people of Yemen. Since Yemen was the stronghold of the false prophet al-Aswad al-Ansi and his followers, in the letter he sent Abu Bakr Siddiq informed the people of Yemen that he was appointing Fayruz as their leader and they should all obey his command and fight the underneath his underneath his banner. Muslims of Persia descend united around their leader Fayruz and the Arab Muslim brothers joined in their cause. Together under the overall leadership of Fayruz, they tirelessly waged war against Al-Aswad and his followers. The Muslims came out victorious in the end, and in stages they were able to restore complete Islamic rule in the region F, in spite of the difficult circumstances that were being faced by the Muslims at al Madina, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu decided that it was necessary to wage an all-out war against nearby apostates, such as the members of the Abyssin and Dibyan tribes. But first, Abu Bakr Siddiq gathered the women and children of the city into the safety of fortresses and nearby mountain passes. With the women and children saved from the treacherous hands of the apostates, the Muslims were able to focus their energies on the war they needed to wage. So now we're going into the sixth portion. The apostates fell in the attempt to take al Madina. The apostates did not wait long before they put their nefarious plans into action. Only three days after the apostate delegates departed from al Madina, an attempt on al Madina was finally made. The attack consisted of fighters from Al-Assad, Ghatfan, Abbas, Gibian, and Bakr tribes. These tribes went or sent only some of their fighters. The rest they stationed at a place called Dihusa, where they were to act as reinforcements. The outer guard units of al Madina learned of their impending attacks and sent news to Abu Bakr Siddiq about the situation. He radiallahu anhu sent a message back to them instructing them to remain where they were. Then Abu Bakr Siddiq and the men who had been with him in the masjid rode out to the outskirts of al Madina in order to fight alongside the outer guard units against the attackers. The enemy had not been expecting much a to stir a uh, terms of resistance. And so they were shocked to see many Muslims fighting, fighters defending the outskirts of al Madinah. During the brief fighting that ensued, enemy fighters became scattered and confused and were forced to retreat. Muslim riders pursued them, the enemy, all the way until dil Husa. But the reinforcements were waiting there, and in order to avert a complete disaster, they set traps for the camels upon which Muslim soldiers were riding. The camels went wild, but not wild enough to throw off their Muslim riders. The camels eventually calmed down, and the Muslims rode them back to al Madina without having incurred any fatalities or casualties. In general, the apostates made the fatal mistake of underestimating their Muslim counterparts. They thought that the Muslims were weak, given the outbreak of apostasy. The departure of Osama's army and the small number of Muslims that remained in al Madina, But they were dead wrong. For example, some of the apostates sent word to the inhabitants of Dil Qisa, a people who had also apostatized and or who had also uh, apostatized, informing them that the Muslims were weak and could easily be defeated. Based on this false information, the inhabitants of Dil Qisa set out towards al Madina, completely unaware of the fact that Allah had other plans for them. As they were marching towards al Madina, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu was leaving al Madina itself. But he was not alone at this time. He radiallahu anhu had with him an army of soldiers. Over the right flank, An-Nu'man ibn Muqarrin was placed in charge, and over the left flank, Abdullah ibn Muqarrin. 
and Suwad ibn Muqarin was placed in charge over the foot soldiers. Before the break of dawn, the two opposing forces drew near to one another. The apostate soldiers, brimming with confidence, did not expect to face any resistance until they reached al Madina itself. And even there, they expected to achieve a swift victory. The Muslim soldiers, on the other hand, were cautious and vigilant, and they knew that they were about to come across the opposing army. They thus decided to lower their voices and to make as little noise as possible so that they could take the enemy by surprise. And a tremendous surprise it certainly was for the apostate soldiers who heard none not even a whisper from the oncoming Muslim fighters until it was too late and until their bodies were being penetrated by swords. The sun did not rise until the enemy had been routed. Most apostate soldiers fled the scene while many of their riding animals were taken as booty by the Muslims. During the course of the fighting, Hubal, brother of Tulayha al-Asdi, was killed. Abu Bakr pursued the enemy until Dil Qissa. Once there, he stationed an Nu'man ibn Muqram there, radiallahu anhu, to take the affairs of the siege and a contingent of soldiers to guard the area. Then he, radiallahu anhu, with the rest of his fighters returned to al Madina. The rest of the apostates became furious when they learned about their humiliating defeat. And in their madness and rage, the leaders of Banu Dibyan and Abs tribes killed those of their fellow tribesmen who were still Muslim. And other apostate tribes soon followed their example upon learning about their dastardly des- deeds. Abu Bakr Siddiq swore that he would attack the guilty tribes and kill a number of their men that was equal to or greater than the number of Muslims that they had brutally executed. Abu Bakr Siddiq was determined to avenge the death of his Muslim brothers and to teach a stern lesson to the leaders of the apostate tribes. As a result of his firm resolve, Muslims who were, num- who were members of apostate tribes became more steadfast upon their religion than ever before, and the apostates were beginning to face more and more humiliating defeat at the hands of their enemies. Many apostates were now terrified of the Muslims, and so they decided to make peace by sending zakah wealth to al Madina. In a single night, zakah wealth reached al Madina from Safwan, Zabakrtan and Adi. During, and during the course of one particular evening, zakah wealth was sent from six different Arab tribes. Each time a zakah collector approached al Madina, people upon seeing him in distance said, Here comes a warner, or in other words, here comes someone who is bringing news of an impending attack by the enemy. Every time this happened, Abu Bakr would respond, Rather, he is a bearer of glad tidings. In the end, it was turning, or it always turned out to be someone who was bringing with him a load of zakah wealth on behalf of the members of his tribe. While all of this was happening, Usama ibn Zayr radiallahu anhu returned victorious from his expedition, which was about 40 days. He and his soldiers radiallahu anhum did all that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had ordered them to do. And they succeeded in following Abu Bakr's instructions to the letter. Their mission completed, it was time for them to rest for a short while. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu was leading a contingent of fighters who were going out to attack apostate tribes. Prior to leaving, he placed Usama ibn Zayd in charge of al Madina, and he radiallahu anhu said to both Usama and the members of Usama's army, rest and give your riding camels a chance to rest. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu headed out with his mentors Dil Qissa, even though many Muslims fearing for Abu Bakr Siddiq's life implored him to stay in al Madina. They said to him, 
We ask you by Allah, O Khalifa of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do not expose yourself to such dangers. If something happens to you, the people will no longer have a government or system to rule. Your staying here is of greater significance than is to the enemy. So send another man in your place so that if he is killed, you can appoint another man to take his place as the leader of the Muslim army. Abu Bakr Siddiq replied, No, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will not do so, but rather I will console you with my own self. Whatever happens to us, you can be comfort, com comforted by the fact that I sacrifice my life for our chance, our cause, the cause of Al-Islam. It is relatively easy to show outward signs of bravery and piety and steadfastness during times of ease and comfort, but it is in harsh circumstances that the true metal of men is ascertained. In times of hardship and severe persecution, some men abandon their principles, morals, beliefs, and even their religion. If that is the case, then we can learn a lot about the character of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, for he lived through not one difficult situation, but a great many and through it all both during the prophet sallallahu lifetime and afterwards he remained steadfast and firm and even that is an understatement he was in fact as solid as the firmest and most unshakable of mountains the threat that was posed by the apostates was grave indeed. In fact, it seemed likely to some that the Muslims were so greatly outnumbered that they would not be able to defeat the apostates. And yet through the entire ordeal, from the moment the Prophet ﷺ died until all of the apostates were defeated, Abu Bakr Siddiq remained a paragon of bravery and patience, setting an example for others which is the responsibility of any Muslim leader, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu was willing to sacrifice his life so that the lives of other Muslims would be spared. His bravery had the effect of motivating other Muslim soldiers and encouraging them to wage war against their enemies. Thus they answered his call to arms not with an attitude or resignation but one of enthusiasm and eagerness to achieve one of two goals, martyrdom or victory. When Abu Bakr Siddiq arrived with his men at the Husa, he met with a Nu'aman, Abdullah and Suwaid radiallahu anhu, all of whom were guarding the area of on behalf of Abu Bakr. Seeing that things were going well at the Husa, Abu Bakr Siddiq traveled on towards the inhabitants of Arabda at Al Abraqo as a result of the battles that ensued or ensued. Al Harith and Auf were defeated, and Al Hati was taken captive. What is more, the tribes of Abs and Banu Bakr were forced to flee the area. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu then made camp at Al Abraq for a number of days. Soon peace would be made with those apostates that were not killed during the battle and who decided to return to the fold of Al-Islam. Nonetheless, in certain instances, Abu Bakr Siddiq was unwilling to return their former lands to them. He conquered Banu Dibyan territory and expelled the members of Banu Dibyan tribe from the region. He then said it is prohibited for Dibyan to take ownership of these lands, for Allah has given these lands to us as war booty. When the apostates were delivered final lethal blow, when they were delivered the final lethal blow and their war with the Muslims came to an end, and when many apostates returned to the fold of Al-Islam and were forgiven for their past transgressions, the people of Banu Talaba returned to their previous lands in order to settle down once again in their former homes. Being told that they did not have the right to live there, they went to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu in Medina and said to him, Why are we being prevented from settling down in our own lands? Abu Bakr Siddiq responded, You have lied 
for you do not have any land that belongs to you. Rather, the land to which you are referring are for me to give to whomever I please. They are lands that I have saved from the evil. Example, you when you apostatized and declared war upon an Islam. Inshallah, we will stop here and continue it with uh, video number 18. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. وتبارك اسم ربك وتعالى جدك ولا إله غيرك ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون السلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين This is page number 371 جزاكم الله خير والسلام